Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Ryan Eisenberg, uh, Executive Director of Achieve Kids in the San Francisco Bay Area, and Joanne Simmons, CEO of the Northeast Arc, covering Northeastern Massachusetts. Thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our webcast guests that you can ask questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. We'll also be taking a few polls, and we'd appreciate uh, your response to those. We'll publish them later on on moppenheim.tv. So thank you so much, Ryan, Joanne. Uh, it's wonderful to have these two parts of the country, sort of bookend parts of the country, talking about uh, disability organizations, uh, disability rights, and the programs that you just cannot stop even during a, a pandemic. Uh, let's let's move uh, from um, uh, well, let's move from east to west. Joanne, why don't why don't you give us sort of the rundown of what you're experiencing right now during this uh, time of pandemic? Oh, thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm Joanne Simons, and uh, one of the things that became most evident at the early part of this pandemic was that now all of the rest of the world understands what people with disabilities face every day, and that's isolation. So while you know you, we get a few months of it. People with disabilities have been experiencing isolation and exclusion for their entire lives. So this wasn't a hard uh, transition for many of them, um, but it certainly has unified our, uh, I think, our understanding of the specific issues of disability. Uh, COVID has hit us uh, particularly uh, uh, hard in the sense that we run 37 group homes and 20% uh, uh, of them were affected by COVID. 20% uh, of our staff, about 17% of the individuals we support were also seeing reinfections. So thank you, Mark, for that reminder to wear masks. It's important. What COVID illustrated, which is something that you know Ryan and I know very well, is that the lower wage workforce, which we depend on to provide services to our folks who have to work multiple jobs because we don't pay them enough to work one job, has fueled this infection. We've seen it in nursing homes and we're seeing it in every low wage worker job. So we now can say that our um, government in some ways has put a price tag because the deaths of individuals with disabilities is directly related to the number of jobs that people have to uh, perform because it was staff who brought the infection into our uh, environments. Um, we've all heard about PPEs. We were very aggressive early on in uh, establishing a cohort of what turned out to be 200 agencies here in Massachusetts to be able to bulk purchase PPEs from overseas. And in spite of some incredible delays, because we were able to predict this uh, pandemic, we're all now in a very comfortable situation and have come from our staff having to wear garbage bags to our staff being fully protected with a six month supply um, ongoing. Um, we took the additional uh, step, um, knowing that this was, was going to probably have some serious ramifications. And we took one of our day program sites, which had to be closed, and turned it into a hotel. And people laughed at me at the beginning, but the hotel was filled. Our 12-bed hotel was filled, and so were two, um, uh, two additional sites. And that's where our staff, who were either positive or who were working in a positive environment and couldn't safely uh, isolate at their own home, were able to have a private bedroom, a pri private bathroom, and three meals a day. Um, I could go on about the heroics of our staff who have sacrificed uh, in order to make sure that the people that we support are safe, and never for a moment did I think that they would be abandoned. Um, we're a large organization. We support 15,000 people. We have uh, 1,100 employees uh, throughout the region and 65% of our business was able to transition very easily within three days to remote services. So what I'm most excited about um, is that families who had found out that their infant or their young child was delayed, they didn't have to panic during this pandemic because we were able to continue to provide them services. So I think I've gone over my allotted introduction time, so. No, it's quite, it's quite okay. The, 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 the point that you're making though, you're making several points. One is that when you look at society, society is defined by us all. It is not just 
those of us who are in fortunate circumstance or those of us who are of a particular race or those of us who have a particular uh, brain chemistry or physical ability or, um, or learning advantage, right? It's all of us. And then you're also talking about the whole idea of health. Health is all of us. It's the health of all of us. So when you, when you segment the, the uh, work that is done by hospital workers and you, and you make it distinct from uh, people in your staff, basically we're all in this together and human health requires this sort of shared responsibility that you're exhibiting and the risk is also shared. A 17% infection rate is just huge in, a, in any community and in your community uh, it, 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 it's, it's particularly dire because you can't stop. Uh, Ryan, you have the same kind of a situation in that you can't stop either. You can't just close down. And so the, this whole issue of, of coming back to school or coming back into environments uh, hits you particularly hard as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. Mark, thank you for having me on this morning. It's a pleasure to present with Joanne. Uh, I'm Ryan Eisenberg and represent uh, Achieve Kids. We operate schools in the Bay Area. Our focus is working with some of the most complex and vulnerable learners in our community. And we really act as an extension of the public school district and helping them meet the needs of their most complex learners in special education. Um, you know, we're celebrating our 60 year anniversary and we were born out of parents who recognized that isolation and exclusion from the school system. And we're really drawn to the idea of equity and creating opportunity in the lives for young people with learning differences and disabilities. And, and as we were faced with this challenge, uh, we kept that very much in focus. And how do we ensure that our students don't have an increased risk at losing equity within the system? How do our students not learn, lose a lot of the learning and skills that they, they gained? And, and have tried to use that as our, our, our focus of how we plan and move to remote learning, how we get some students back on campus, and how we get resources in the home for our, our families. I think you know when we closed down in March, a lot of our families were really um, left with situations that they had to juggle. Like a lot of families, work, students at home trying to navigate um, learning. And with our kids, that that support at home needs to be very direct, very one-on-one, -on -one and has a direct impact. So in our planning, we thought through not only how to deliver the educational resources to families, but how do we deliver support so that they can carry on some. Uh, with, their, with their mental health solid, with food in the home, with technology in the home, and just basic resources, and really drove ourselves to make sure we were, were filling the needs that we were founded under and making sure that we were thinking larger about what the, the crisis um, entailed. Do you both feel that this, that this question of close down completely or open up completely. Do you feel that that's the right framing here, Joanne? How, how would you frame that? Uh, you, okay, you're shaking, you're shaking your head. I kind of knew you were gonna say no, but how would you frame this? Well, first of all, I'll tell you that closing down is really easy. Opening up is really difficult because the guidelines are challenging. It's not us, it's not six feet, the, you know, the, the common thought. It's actually six feet in this, you, an individual has to six, have six feet and then another six feet. So the tremendous amounts of issues in terms of space, in terms of transportation, in terms of the, the comfort of families, having people return to, st return to program before there's a vaccine, the health status of individuals is all different. You know, I sort of come from this from not only running this huge organization, but I have a son, an adult son who has Down syndrome who after 18 years of living by himself, on Cape Cod, and we live about two hours away from him, he came home for four and a half months, not because I was afraid of disease in, or infection control, but loneliness, the issue that, you know, we first talked about, that he would be alone, his not being able to work, uh, and he has subsequently returned because in order to keep his job, he needed to show up after four months, but so it's I we are we are in the process of doing a soft reopening of those services that closed and it how do you transport people who used to rely on a transportation system when they have to be six feet distance that means one person per van the complexity of trying to do that safely in a way that meets everyone's um, interests but most importantly satisfies your funders which in this case is the state or some federal guidelines 
is proving to be um, an elusive target, that one which is changing daily. And this is not to criticize our state or federal partners. It's, it's because we're all reacting to new information every day. So two weeks ago, we, we didn't think that young children were spreaders. Now we understand that they're spreaders again, which is an issue for Ryan. So it is not open or closed. It is gonna be with us in surges. We're, we're preparing for the worst and we're hoping for the best that we're gonna see an uptick. Now here in Massachusetts, you know, we're one of the model states in terms of that, you know, we had a very strong, uh, very strong leadership by our governor and a very uh, compliant, somewhat compliant uh, population. And Ryan, um, you you also have this this issue of, of serving people who, if you stop service, there is a huge amount of regression in terms of the progress that is made. Um, you can't stop, but you also have a situation where you know when when young people come back into school environments. Um, we all get sick. All the adults get sick. Um, and and um, how do you how do you do this? Where a lot of the learners that you have are very tactile learners. How do how do you uh, navigate that? Yeah, I think first and foremost it's transparency. I think anytime we're creating contact in a time like this, there is enhanced risk for spread of COVID. Now, obviously, we want to not do that, and we want to keep people as safe as possible. But to go back to your original question, we can't live in extremes. We can't just say we're going to keep uh, our students isolated and do everything remote. And we also can't say we're going to bring everybody back. And we have to think really creatively around how do we meet our students' needs and how do we target those that maybe have uh, very particular needs and make sure we do things in a safe way. Over the summer, we ran a pilot program where we brought back um, about half of our students in uh, uh, our extended school year. And we tested out a variety of safety, safety systems and how to manage our campus so we could better learn what would it look like to have learning on our campus. In addition, we've looked at how do we identify community locations or how to provide support in the home in a safe, equitable way so that we're able to get some of those pieces in place. I think the, the larger questions really, you know, how do we balance all the safety demands that, that are there? If we stay in isolation, especially our students, but even beyond our students, there's such increased risk for mental health needs, for um, loss of resources, for feelings of depression, um, for, for some other really poor negative health outcomes. Additionally, you know, talking in instruction through schools, our kids are much more at risk for loss of learning, which has long-term impacts for their outcomes, which could be really detrimental to our communities and to those young people. And so we have to really say, how do we create that balance to make sure that we're, we're accounting for the learning and the supports that need to be put in place, but doing that in a safe way. And I think situations like this offer the opportunity to think differently, to, to provide innovation, and to think of instruction in different modes. Our plan moving forward, although um, we have some state regulations around what we can and can't do, is to have some level of resources here on our campuses so that we can have some students here, but also to do some things in the community and the homes to just make sure we're accounting for who our kids are, who our families are, and how we best meet their needs and, and kind of help them keep moving towards their opportunity in their future. Um, I wanted to uh, draw everyone's attention to this poll that is going on. I'm going to keep it up for another 30 seconds or a minute. Uh, in the hopes that, that others uh, can, can complete it. But we asked uh, in the last 10 years, have Americans shown a different level of awareness and support for the disability community? And what's interesting is that there, there is a 29% uh, response to say that there's been more awareness in the la and support in the last 10 years. And then 64 uh, say that there's been more awareness, but not much more support. It's a very interesting, um, interesting analysis. So you have the vast majority of individuals who believe that there's more awareness, some believe that there's more support, some believe not much more support. It doesn't look like people feel that, that there's been backsliding, which is, which is really interesting. So there seems to be appetite for more support. So what kind of support can benefit society and benefit your constituents, uh, each of you? Ryan, why don't, why don't we start with you? Um, and then Joanne, if you could weigh in as well, what kind of, if, if we have this energy um, that is really driving and is willing to be informed and to, and to provide more resource, what form should that take, Ryan? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I, I do think there's much more awareness in the community, but there, there's not really thought, thinking through how to kind of make it practical. 
Um, you know, in schools, we hear a, a term inclusion a lot, and inclusion is often defined as direct work in a general ed classroom. And to me, the challenge is expanding that frame and thinking about what does it look like in our community and how do we have communities that display the equity that we value and how do we create access within our communities for all, all people. And then it's looking at where are the holes and the gaps. And some of those are employment, some of those are in housing and, and putting direct work and resources into how do we fill in those gaps so that we all kind of live in a system um, that, that's more equitable. Just like special education that I referenced earlier, really born out of parents and parents recognizing things and then driving that change, founding schools like Achieve Kids and many other schools in the area. And then that led to kind of federal special education law development. Um, you're seeing the same thing happening in housing where families are coming up with really creative ways to create housing opportunities for their young people so that their um, children can have more independence and more access to the community because there's a failure within the larger system to create that, that gap. And I think it's finding those um, interesting uh, um, social innovations and, and driving those to the larger discussion so that we can, we can start creating some of the solutions that need to exist in our, our, our community. I had an interesting conversation with a, um, a, a business the other day, a very large um, multinational business that, that started a program around um, uh, hiring individuals with autism, set a larger goal, had it very defined as a program. And then in their rethinking of it, defined it of it can't be an established program, it has to be more of a cultural change. And they've been reevaluating their interviewing process, they've been reevaluating kind of the norms and the values that they hold in employment and how they match people to particular jobs. And it's a great conceptual way to kind of grow it out and make it much more the way of doing business instead of being a targeted program and kind of embedding some of those things in the system. And I think it's changes like that and it's seeing thought leaders like that and that can help drive us all to a better place. Maybe we all have to change ourselves as well. You know, I have this, this old phone. This is an old uh, Galaxy 7. Um, and, you know, it's beaten up. It's a little slow and so on. And I, I really want a new one, right? But do I really need it, right? Joanne, you were talking about the fact that your people are not necessarily valued nor paid enough to have that one job. Uh, of, of exercising their skills on behalf of others to help, to help them. And, and maybe I don't need another phone. Maybe that money is better invested in people. And maybe that's, that's an attitude adjustment that I personally have to grapple with. Um, how do you see this? How do we change this, this idea of investing and building awareness and, and changing our attitudes as Americans in a, in a way that would advantage uh, society and, and your constituents? Well, it's a timely question in spite of the fact that I took notes to answer the one that Ryan did. I'm going to switch <laughs> gears and say that um, this is a particularly important conversation to have now because what we've seen um, with, you know, what I say to our team members now is, you know, COVID eventually, we're going to figure out COVID eventually. We're going to have a treatment. We're going to have a vaccine we will eventually, it will go away. But what has become even more significant the conversation that we're having is around the conversation around race, diversity, inclusion, which has taken hold in this country. And that is actually related to the question that you have about, you know, which really comes down to philanthropy. Um, in that we have seen a huge response to the racial inequity in this country in the philanthropy community. People are you know, um, diverting their funds, changing their funds. The question is whether or not are people digging deeper into their pockets, for example, the money that you would save in replacing your Galaxy phone and, and doing some really creative, innovative, thoughtful philanthropy, or are people just doing this, you're, you're staying with the phone and instead you're using it for some other, um, or saving the money. Um, I don't know what, the answer yet, because it's kind of early, but it is a little frightening for those of us, Ryan and I, the work that we're doing is not going away. It's not going to go away with when COVID ends. And I am concerned that the issue around race, diversity, and inclusion, um, somehow, which we need to continue, and I have many conversations with our staff, but it also is an opportunity for us to talk about things like health in inequity, we saw it, we are seeing during COVID that people are making healthcare decisions wanted to based on disability. 
And our position is that if there's a limited amount of medicine or ventilators, for example, it, disability should not be a factor. What should be a factor is the person's ability to survive, you know, and it should be an equal litmus test across race, age, ethnicity, gender, whatever we're talking about. But we saw the ugliness that we thought um, had been submerged. And I have a 40 year, year lens and I can tell you that I think we've made tremendous progress in 40 years in many areas. I think that, um, you know, we've taught, we, and you know, Ryan you know, alluded to some of this, the idea of what services should, should be, they should be self-directed consumer driven, which includes families. Um, we, we saw, and it's a little bit of an aside, but we saw a paradox during this pandemic, which is families, many families reported that their adult children did better at home than they did at our programs. And I'm not talking about my program, but I'm talking collectively what we saw here in Massachusetts. And so I think there's a moment here for us to pause to say, how are we going to incorporate what the families learned and redesign our service, service system? Because what they said was, you know, the fact that there were less demands, that, you know, there wasn't a parade of different staff, there was a little bit more choice, it was a little bit more relaxed. Now, on the other hand, some people didn't, didn't, didn't do as well, and Ryan's students probably are among the group of people who, because of their unique mental health needs, um, suffered more than some of the folks that I'm re referring to. So, so in terms of this, this, this poll, again, we're, we have confirmation that there's, there's pent-up willingness uh, to invest more. We asked whether, the, whether com people believe that their communities have made adequate accommodations for those with developmental disabilities. And almost 70% of, of those responding said no, that, that we have not made adequate uh, accommodations. And 31% um, and said, I'm not sure. Nobody has said that, that the accommodations have been adequate. So I, so I guess this, this whole issue uh, does come down to uh, our thinking it through, our providing a little bit of mind share, a little bit of our time to consider the repercussions of, uh, of that and whether we are willing uh, to, to make that investment and what form uh, it will take. Uh, let me ask you uh, this, this whole question that, that you raised about the intersectionality between medical ethics, the whole idea of civil rights, um, the whole idea of disability rights, the, uh, the idea of racism. You know, if I look back in my life, um, I didn't start speaking until very late. I didn't really start reading until about third or fourth grade. Um, I navigated um, those, those requirements by just memorizing stuff. Um, but I couldn't deal with encoded language. Um, and if I think about the advantages that I had through my parents who were both educated, uh, they were uh, middle class, had, had means to, uh, to educate me. Um, I ended up uh, being on this track, whereas uh, had I lived a different life, I might have ended up uh, uh, not going through school, not having many prospects. I could have gotten, uh, my, my anger and frustration could have been outwardly directed. It could have uh, led to all sorts of misfortune and violence. Um, and, and now, you know, we have this, this whole intersectionality between uh, race. It's very simple to look at figures and see where different circumstances and racial injustices and economic injustices can lead to unfortunate outcomes. How do we deal with that as a society? Because Ryan, you have to pay for your services. Joanne, you have to pay for your services. How does that function? Is it all about government stepping in or do we all have to collectively come together and start grappling with some of these realities? You know, that's a great question. And there's kind of a lot of levels um, within that question. And thank you for sharing your, your personal story and your personal connection. And, um, you know, obviously that's a story that's turned out really well. And, and you highlighted really well some of the embedded inequities within our system and how um, those can influence what the outcome of any young person could be. And I think that's the, the larger discussion and it's those embedded items that we have to take a hard look at. I think the opportunity that comes out of um, COVID is we're being really forced to look at some of those things and the communities that are directly affected, the kids with the larger um, equity gaps, the workforce that's coming in that often has to work two jobs when they're in a, what we're calling an essential job. And how do we then put values to that? And, and I think we do need to see larger investments from our government partners 
um, whether that's um, greater funding within IDEA, um, which has been um, something that's been promised for more years than uh, would, would like to be represented, to statewide funding and how we invest resources in critical um, places so that our teachers don't have to work a second job, so that um, some of the professionals that we're trying to pull into um, these high need areas have the appropriate training and the time they need to develop and they can um, adequately address some of the complexities within the, the young people that we work with. And at the same time, our communities need to have that same um, evaluation, much like you described earlier with, with your phone in terms of what do we feel like um, deserves um, or, or should have our, our resources to, to lift up. I think the, the uh, contract that nonprofits have with the government is um, that we're able to do certain things through um, a private means um, to help the government do things better. But in order to do that, we have to have community support and kind of collectively grow the community for the greater, greater good. And so I do think there's a piece where it takes all of us kind of taking a look at what do we want to see in our community? And then how do we make sure we put the resources in place, whether that's government, private citizens, or, or all of us um, to, to drive us into that goal. And Joanne, I'm going to let you have the last word, but before we do that, I just wanted to uh, report on the last poll. This is really interesting. It's the most interesting of, uh, of our three polls. The question we ask is, what is the biggest issue faced by the disability community? And, and th this is a multiple, you, you can select multiple answers. So 44% uh, said that it, lack of resources. 28% uh, said impediments to participation which the ADA was really designed uh, mostly to address. Uh, ignorance of others got a whopping 56%. Mm -hmm. um, employment, jobs, 28%. 6% um, said the ADA is a positive step, but an inadequate solution. And there were, there were other uh, uh, views. And of course, in the disability community, there are going to be as many uh, different views as people. Uh, so I don't want to suggest that we asked the right questions. We, we did our best, and, and of course, it, it'll fall short. Joanne, uh, what, what is your answer to how we move forward to a more just society in America that really represents what American ideals uh, would have it represent? I think uh, your poll was uh, a pretty good representation of some very intelligent people who were um, you know, thoughtful about it. Um, I think we've seen in COVID perhaps the uh, pathway for what needs to happen, which is there were partnerships developed between you know, uh, our local stakeholders, you know, our, our state funders. Um, we've seen Medicaid, the federal government. We've seen the barriers of competition and turf uh, melt away as we were all working together towards one goal, which was to keep everyone safe. So I'm a little bit of an um, optimist in that, you know, I actually think that we, um, that the ADA provided us with some real teeth to be able to do some really important things. And any parent knows, does, may not know that those curb cuts that makes it easy for their the stroller to go from the sidewalk to the street is a result of ADA. We've all benefited. By, by the ADA, and we may not even realize how many of those um, elements uh, we're grateful for those, um, that bipartisan support. So what we need is we need the bipartisan support. We need to be able to get rid of the competition that exists among us and the competition that exists between the competing needs of a community. You know, so it's not pitting uh, homelessness and food insecurity against disability, but realizing that it's the collective uh, need to be able to have good, healthy communities that we all benefit. So there's a, a quote that I like to uh, say, because it's very simple, but it really sum, sums up COVID perfectly, I think, which is, we're not all in the same boat. We are all in the same storm. And that actually can be applied to all the issues, is that, you know, as you talked about, Mark, having the resources that your family would be able to address um, the, your educational needs. The majority of the folks that many organizations work with don't have that. I look at my own grandsons and think, okay, school might not open, let's send him to private school because he's not riding in a dinghy with a leak in it. Um, but we have to make sure that those dinghies and those holes and those boats get repaired so everybody has an equal, an equal opportunity towards to what we have been able to achieve because of the zip code we were born in. As people riding out the same storm, 
in the aftermath of the storm and even during the storm, we must help each other. The, the uh, issue that we face really is as old as the founding of the country. And, and we need to give some thought as to how uh, we respond and whether we are ready for the moment. People talk about never letting a crisis go to waste. And really what they mean is do not let the lessons of the crisis go to waste. Um, learn from those lessons. In, within this response is a lot of wisdom that we can collectively apply during the storm and after the storm. Thank you both, uh, Ryan Eisenberg. Um, thank you so much for your uh, description of your work at Achieve Kids and that of your staff, your volunteers and your community. Uh, Joanne Simons, uh, CEO of the Northeast Arc. Thank you so much for bringing your wisdom and that of your people uh, and, and uh, your staff and your board uh, to bear uh, your community. That's the nonprofit report. Thank you very much for uh, attendees for your attention and for your ongoing support of the disability community and have a great day. Stay safe all.